Uh, my name is David Sample. I'm going to be talking about functional programming in C++. Um, really quickly, how many people in here uh, have used a functional programming language? How many people have used Haskell? Less? How many are really good at Haskell? C++. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so I'm going to talk about functional programming, uh, the what, the why, and the how. Uh, what is functional programming? Uh, why would you care? And how to do it specifically in C++. And I'm going to be covering a few different aspects. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get all the way through the slides because I've got a lot of material here. But the first thing we're going to talk about is algebraic data types. Uh, then we're going to talk about functions. We're going to talk about generic programming. And then category theory. Um, how many people are familiar with category theory? Monads, monoids. Okay, a few of you. Um, so, algebraic data types this is just a way to think about types. And uh, so, one of the things is an algebraic data type called unit. And it's a primitive type, has exactly one value, and it's denoted left parenthesis, right parenthesis. And if you don't understand something, please stop me, because it sort of builds on itself. Um, but you can just think about it as a built-in type that has exactly one value. And they just call it <laughs> And then products, um, which is denoted like that, is a way to compose types together. So, one of, so a value of type A and B is has a value of type A and a value of type B. So this is, you recognize this is basically tuples or um, Cartesian products. They talk about that in math. Um, so that's, that's pretty obvious what that type is. And we got sum, which people don't often think about very much, but is very, very useful. And that's A or B. So something of A sum, sum B, a value of A sum B, has a value of A or a value of B. So it's sort of like the analog of the and. The variant. The variant. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so we can press this up here. And I have a couple other little constructs here. Is the same as. Um, basically says that whenever I, you see A in the program, you might as well have where B can be some expression of things. So that's um, at a very simple level, you can think of it like type depths or whatever. It's just saying A represents B. You can use A where you use B or B where you use A. This implemented with is different. That says that wherever you see B, you can't just pass it in A or vice versa. But for every A, there is basically a corresponding B. So um, this is like to hide an implementation detail to make a new type, even though it, it includes all of type B as possibilities of values of type A, it's something completely distinct. And maybe we'll see, maybe uh, we'll see some examples where that will make more sense. Okay, so here's a simple example. I'm saying true is implemented in terms of unit. So in other words, the type true, this isn't a value true, the type true has exactly one value. Okay? And, but it's not the same thing as unit. It's something different, but it has exactly one value. And the same thing is false. So the bool type is either a value of type true or a value of type false. Usually we don't think about things like this, but with algebraic data types, everything has a type, even things like true and false. Um, yeah, so how are we on that so far? Could, instead of um, is implemented, could, could one think of in terms of defined as, or, or would that be wrong? Well, um, we're separate. We're distinct. Making a distinction between is implemented with and is the same as. So, is defined. It depends on what you want to mean okay. by that. You, if you maybe is defined as would would work if you define it as the same thing as I'm defining it here. So. But, but typically, in functional programming, they, they use is implemented with. 
Okay, so Z <coughs> is implemented with unit, and N is either a Z or an N. Okay, so here we have a recursive example. And we'll, we'll look at a couple uh, possibilities for this data type here, N. So we're just saying Z is in Z, lowercase Z is in Z, uppercase Z. We're just saying that is the one, Z only has one possibility for a value. We're naming that value Z. And, uh, and the way that we're talking about um, like n sub zero, we're saying when we're referring to some types like this, zero means that it has, you know, a value of this side. One means it has a value of this side. So in this case, the first instance of n, the first value type n, zero left side, z that one type of z. Okay, so that's a, the easiest way you can get a value of n. We're calling n zero. And one is um, one, which means we're going to go to the right side, and the value of type n that we're going to refer to is the one up here, n zero. And as you can see, as we go forward, we're, what we're essentially doing, what n is, is the natural numbers. This is Zermelo. If you mathematics, it's Zermelo. What's the name? Zermelo. The same mathematical definition of number is the same. Yep, so this is like a unary representation of the natural numbers. Okay, so we're going to extend our algebraic data types to do type functions. So what we do is we take our is the same as or is implemented with symbol and add a, uh, a parameter to the left side of it. So here's an example. We're saying this thing we'll call that empty list, so we're giving a hint as to what this is. It's just, it has a single value, um, it's the same thing as unit, well it's implemented with unit, so it only has one value. And then L of A, where A is a parameter, is the same thing as either this empty list, or a value of type A, and a list. So for those of you who've done functional programming before, you'll recognize this as basically cons on this side. This is cons, and this is null. And we're using this notation to um, get our, make, make this a general type list as opposed to a list of ints or something like that. So uh, we'll look at some examples of lists. So here, zero means we're on the left side, E. And I say up there that E is the value of type empty list. So that would be a, an empty list. One, which means we're choosing the right side, and then we use a pair here, where a is a sub i is some value of, of a, and then it's also coupled with a list, so we'll use this list element, empty list. So this is a one, a list of size one, and then here is a list of size two. We just keep on applying the recursion, and you can see that we have a sub i and a sub j in here, it has two different uh, value types in that list. How are we now? Still okay? Good, because it's not much harder. <laughs> so here is a binary tree in um, algebraic data type notation here uh, with an arbitrary type at the leaves. So uh, A here would be the type, and let's see if I can remember how this is. It's either going to be two trees or a leaf with a value of type A. Okay. So, so all the ones will have the same type A and have the different type A. Well, in this particular tree, there is no value at the... The type, I mean. At the inner, right. So in this case, all the type the, at the leaves only. All the leaves will be A. All the leaves will be of type A. Right. Yeah, but they can be different values of A. <laughs> Okay, so algebraic data types obviously is a very abstract way to talk about types. Um, and it's very simple, we're only talking five operators here, and they're extremely powerful. You know, we saw how we could make a list, make a tree, you can make a tree with, uh, you know, with one type at the nodes and other type at the leaves, however you want. But it gives you a very succinct notation, so 
when I program, I think in algebraic data types. And we'll get, and we'll, I think the next thing we're going to talk about is how to take it from this thought and implement it in the C++. Okay, so before we do that, I just want to sort of give you my biases so you know how why I implement things the way you um, One thing is I don't like syntax sugar. Um, I think that functions are enough, <laughs> named functions. So um, you're not going to see any syntax sugar that I do here. I just stick with functions. And if someone wants to make syntax sugar on top of these concepts, then that's wonderful. I probably wouldn't use it, but uh, you, you can definitely do it if you want to. It needs to mix well with typical C++. Other functional libraries I've seen, you have to like be in their special world. I don't want to do that. I want to mix really well with typical C++, I mean boost. <coughs> it needs to mix well with boost and the standard stuff. Um, and I'm not copycatting other languages like Haskell and their limitations. It turns out in C++ you can do things that are not possible in Haskell uh, with, with the current standard they have right now. So let's look at some easy things. So a unit, I'm just saying use boost MPL void underscore. That, that works just fine. Uh, because void is typically what you put as, as the return type, although it's not really a return type of a function. Um, in functional languages, you often think of that as unit, as to what's the return type of something that doesn't actually return anything important. Um, so to make new unit types, I just say struct T, um, left bracket, right bracket. It's very simple. I'm just making a new type. It has exactly one value, but it's not the same thing as unit type. You can think of it as it's implemented in terms of unit type. Um, and is the same as, for a simple thing like this, I just use a type def. So, and one thing to remember is that when you do type def, you got to flip the types around from the way you normally think about things. All right, so there's a few options you can do with product types. Um, the most simple one is using a struct. So if I have Z is a, an A, a B, and a C, then I just make a struct called Z with three members, one of type A, one of type B, and one of type C. And the main benefit of using a struct is you get named accessor. It's a sort of a free thing you get. You can also use uh, a boost fusion vector which is preferable in a lot of cases. Um, and the benefit that you get with a vector is that you can access your different um, underlying types by index. So that makes generic programming a heck of a lot easier. Although you can take a struct and make it work sort of like a fusion vector, um, that's pretty nice. And another thing that I didn't mention up here is that when you use a struct, you have to give it a, a type name. When you use a vector, it can be anonymous. You can as functions, so that's different. And boost fusion map, which is kind of nice, uh, but if you have a lot more syntax you got to deal with, you can access it by name, the individual elements, or you can access them by index. So you sort of get the, the both best of both worlds there. Now, for for details on this stuff, uh, definitely check out the paper that corresponds with this talk because I, I explicitly give examples and stuff like that. I don't have time for that. And where does one find that paper? Um, it seems like at the end of every day, uh, the presentations and corresponding papers are put online. Okay. So at the BoostCon website. At the BoostCon website, you have to look for like the community wiki. Oh, okay. I believe, and they're out there. Okay, some types. These aren't really well supported in C++ uh, unless you consider boost variant, which helps a lot. One way to do it is to use an enum. Now, the limitations of enum is that the underlying types need to be unit types, okay, and not used elsewhere, because they're not really types according to C++. But if you don't use them as types, then enum will work fine. Um, you can use a product type with an index, which is commonly what you see in libraries. So, for example, boost, I mean, not boost, uh, cute. You, they use this thing all the time. They might have one function that says, you know, whether or not to use this value, and you set that value with another function. So, like one might say, uh, use automatic height, true or false, and then set automatic height, or set actual height, and only use the actual height variable if the other one is set to true. 
So that, to me, just sort of screws things up in my head because that is much better thought of as a sum type. It's either this, it's either going to be automatic, or it's going to be this specific value. Um, so I typically don't use a power type with index like that. Um, or you can use a polymorphic base class. When I say polymorphic, I mean the C++ idea of polymorphic. So we have a pointer to the base, and then each of the individual derived classes, um, course, one of those corresponds to each of your individual type. The nice thing, go ahead. Sorry, you should say the, the object-oriented notion of polymorphic, because C++ has compiled line polymorphism as well. Oh, and okay. We talk about that. Good. I'd much rather not think of C++ with that type of polymorphism. Me too. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so the, the one thing that's nice about this is it scales really well. You could have like a variant, or not a variant, a uh, some type of like 100 different possible values. Um, but in general, I, I don't like the syntax for it. Um, and if you do it in a generic way, it's, it's very error prone if you need to select between the different uh, base derived classes. So, Boost variant is the best option we got so far. Um, you can have arbitrary underlying types, which means that it's better than enum. There's a small syntax overhead, which means it's better than uh, derived classes. And you can access by index or type. So you can say, I want the third, well, you can, it's sort of hard to think about this, but it essentially gives you a type list embedded in there that you can use to see what your underlying types are, which is good for generic programming. And um, I don't think I mentioned this, but the, the one negative thing about variant when you're using these sum types is that these types can't be repeated. They all need to be distinct. Otherwise, you get, I think, it's undefined behavior or something like that. OK, so now we're going to talk about this implemented with. Does, does everybody follow what we've done so far? So, so how do you overcome that problem? Well, what you can do is you can make new types, you know, is implemented with, and then you sort of have a distinction there, giving a, a tag or whatever. All right, is implemented with, uh, in general, we saw how to do it with unit types. In general, we just wrap it in a struct. So here's an example where we're talking about real numbers between 0 and 1. We're going to represent that as a double, but it's not the same thing as a double. There's a bunch of double values that you don't want to be in there. So what I generally do is do a struct with an explicit constructor here um, that the user doesn't use directly. So I'd make a separate function to create a value of this type. Um, and the accessor functions uh, like to convert it into a double, like the invariant is guaranteed. Or if you want to uh, make a function called clamp that takes an arbitrary double and puts it in the 0, 1 range and returns one of those. So those are. Um, what I call accessor functions. Why wouldn't you put the invariant guaranteeing in the constructor and use that? I mean, why, do you, why does it create them with a separate function that has the general rule? Right. I do that because um, converting a double to a struct, I want that to be explicit in terms of what that means. So, like clamp is a good example. I understand. Okay. Um, and there's also internal accessor functions where if you want to mess with the internals, then it's up to you to make sure that the invariant stays. So uh, for optimization purposes or whatever. All right, so type functions is the same as style. This is this corresponds directly with the type function trait that's used in boost NPL. So here's an example of uh, none is the same as the unit type, op a, I mean, is, it, is implemented with unit type op a is the same as none or a. So if you think about this for a second, what we really have here is the optional type uh, in, in algebraic data types. So, but this is a function here. So here we use the uh, type function trait style, which hopefully will be replaced with template aliases someday. But for now, struct none, we declare our unit type. And we have our template here, and we type def whatever is on the right hand side and call it type. And that will mix well with other types. Is there a reason you're not using boost optional? Yes, because boost optional uh, doesn't help me explain these things. But 
But right. so in real code, I'd use boost optional because it's already there. But okay. <clears throat> All right. So type functions is implemented with style are assembly essentially wrapping something in a templ template struct. So where before the template had a nested type, now the, the template is the type. So um, here we have optional, the exact same data type except we're using as implemented with. And you can see it's similar to the other example with the R01, you have an explicit constructor and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between this and the previous step? Okay, so this one has a nested type def. The next one has a member. Okay, uh, recursive types are sort of another beast. Um, so to, for a sum type with variants, you can make those recursive. They have a special make recursive variant thing that you can make a recursive sum type. And that, that works well. And if you look at the paper, I explain exactly how to do that. For product types, I found a hack that you can use make recursive variant to do product types. Um, Could you explain why, why a recursive type, what it is, and why is that a useful idea? Um, well, earlier on, okay. the, okay. yeah. That's what I wanted to know. So, if you think about it, then what the heck is a recursive product type? How can you have a tuple that has, on the right-hand side, an instance of the, of the left-hand side? Does anybody see why that seems like nonsense? No. How much storage space would it take mm -hmm. to store something like that? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that's why that should seem like nonsense, okay? Um, because you obviously can't store something this infinitely long on your computer. But it is a nonsense. Um, what's that? Exactly. So if you think of this in terms of, of the right-hand side being a computation of that type, then it, it, you can actually get this inf in infinitely long product type. And does anybody have an idea how to re represent a computation in C++? Recursive function? Recursive function. Yes. <coughs> what, what kind of boost function? Zero argument function is basically it. So here I have my lazy type function, which returns a boost function returning a value of type A. So that works. So now returning back to this S thing, we can see that this really is a stream of type A, something that goes on to infinity. You can keep on pulling stuff off the top. And uh, I implement this in the paper in the back this just directly following the rules that we've just talked about. Okay, so now we're going to move on to functions. Has everybody got algebraic data types down? Any? <laughs> any okay, maybe that was the wrong phrasing. <laughs> Does anybody want to help me teach you? I'd like, to see, that. That I'd like to see that example. I haven't noticed the benefit yet. So. I, uh, well, let me, if, if there's time at the end, I'll, I'll pull up. Yeah, actually, I think that a motivating example would have been yeah. nice. Huh? <laughs> Please, I'm not sure you're going with this. Since yeah. you, since you, since you asked, but a motivating example of um, how one would do a simple calculation uh, with the algebraic type machinery that you've already made. Okay. For, just for example, I mean, I'm sure that you can make a one-line factorial calculation out of this, but it's not. I couldn't do it. Although I think I probably should be able to at this point. I, I don't know if you'll be able to do an, a one-line factorial comp computation yet because okay. this is okay. it has, it has to do with functions. What, what, what I'm doing in my head right now is just keep putting this in my head, waiting for 
an aha moment. At the end. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> so this was originally going to be a two-part thing where I show you enough information to understand it, and then I show you all the awesome applications. Yeah. But it isn't a two-part thing, actually. Uh, I only got this time. Um, but look at the paper. It explains how to use these things. And if you try to use it, if you try to think in terms of algebraic data types, you'll, you'll very quickly see why this is a great way to think about problems. You're pretty fluent in this stuff. I, I'm sure that like in about two minutes you could sketch on the board just something that would give everybody in the room sort of something to hold on to. We're pretty familiar with these advanced techniques, C++ techniques. We understand how variant works and, and you know pretty much have mapped those onto the, the idea of algebraic data types. I really think it would help the room, I mean, because that's what I keep hearing is give me something concrete. You can only go along with the code. Go so far with the code. You don't want to see code at some point. Sure. Okay. Uh, well, maybe I can uh, show you how to implement a list. Oh, I raise this for you? Yeah. And I know you're comfortable with this because it's on all your slides. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have to confine. It won't compile, <laughs> but, okay, so we talked about list. We had empty type is implemented in terms of uh, this thing. So let's, instead of calling it this, let's call it EL. And uh, we have our list of type A is... Um, either EL or the product of type A and list of A. Okay? So this is how I think of lists. Right, so we got a comment over here sort of thing. So the direct implementation, take this line, that's, we know how to do that. Now we have a type function, so we do uh, template of the variant, the first one is EL, comma, and the second one is this, so we'll use a boost fusion vector since it's a product type, so I'll just call that VEC. <coughs> the first one is of type A, we have that up here, so that's fine, and the second one is list of A, so with the recursive vari variant, uh, there's some special... You need a class name to that, you need a class list or something like that, yeah. start list. Um, and there's like uh, some special thing that you use to say you want to recurse on the variant, so we'll call that RV. So type def that as type. That's it. So this yeah. would be an MPL list, right? A type list? No. This would be a real, it can hold values? Yes. Because it's a fusion, fusion and recursive variant. So, so, so you, you say list column column this type is the type computation, right? This is the type computation. So already where does it hold the value? Okay, so if you want to make a list of type A, now now we have that done. Uh, a little block over here. You say uh, list of the total column type. <laughs> Intensive purposes that that could have just been just as well as an STD pair, right? Yes. Where is the storage? It's a sort of magical fusion vector. It's in the fusion vector. Oh, oh. And the make recursive variant has a, a 
um, an implementation that I believe uses um, like a linked list if you want the recursion. Oh. So. And um, I explain how to use this in the code. It's, it's pretty straightforward. But, um, but the idea is you start with something abstract, really powerful, has a direct implementation. I, I didn't have to make any decisions when I did this. It just I, it came myself. Exactly. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah. Well, actually, now I have a question. Uh, did I understand a little bit? So this is actually this is all a compile time mechanism. So far, we don't have let's call it the equivalent to a computer program that's actually going to do something for us, right? We basically used a, we developed this system for generating types as needed that are arbitrarily complicated from these simple operations. And so what we now is have a a, a method for generating any type that we might need, any r really complex type in a systematic or routine or what's the word I'm looking for? Automatic way almost. Right. And l unless you want to use some of those different options that we have. That for. But. Okay. So we haven't actually calculated anything yet. We're just thinking about it. And, and creating values. Yeah. Okay. Them. So this, this L is a list of ints. So, so once we get into functions, that's what they're going to use to operate on that type, to insert values, to get values out of them. Yeah, well, and you can look up in the documentation for how to, how to access values of variants and how to access values of vectors. And in the paper, it explains that, too. I'm not going to go into that directly. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay, functions. So I'm defining a function up here. A set S of pairs, A, B, where A is an A, B is an B, for every A, there exists exactly one corresponding pair in S. Does anybody not follow that? It's a pretty straightforward definition of a function. You just think of a function as a set of pairs that map something of type A to something of type B. So your, your definition here doesn't admit singularities. Right. Like, like, for example, like if you think about That's correct. division, like that's a singularity where the divisor is zero. Well, then it wouldn't be a member of the pairs. Then. I mean, it's it's, it's just a finite or list of functions. No, it's it's not of, not of, well, you have to restrict a the yeah. domain of a. Right. So, so the, the, the extent okay. of a domain a of okay, so zero comma b wouldn't be in the set. I get it. Like if I cross this out, for every A there exists exactly one corresponding pair in S, then what you'd have is a partial function. Yeah. Oh, but that's sort of irrelevant. Yeah. We're talking about full functions here. But you can't generate random numbers with that. No, you because well, you always get a different B out of it. Yes. So this is, yeah. if you hear Haskell people talking about pure, yeah, this pure is function. a pure function. Yeah, okay. So. What is a C++ function? Now we know what pure functions are. What's a C++ function? Here's an example half. You might say it's an int to a bool. So you just take the argument, and you take the result value, and that's its type. Uh, as you can probably guess, that's not good enough, because we're not handling multiple arguments here. Um, let's try one with multiple arguments. So here we can use our um, so our product type uh, tuple to think of it like this. And I call those uh, C function tuples. Okay? That's ugly on purpose. So when I read this in a C code, I see this side, I'm creating a special C function tuple and then applying it to the function. Um, but there's still something missing. Let's take a look at this function. Um, we increment some global variable and return true. This doesn't really work, because if you think about it in the set notation, I don't have anything that can correspond to the increase in that global variable. Um, does everybody see that so far? Because this is sort of an important part. This is too exciting. Exactly. So here's what people do. They say, OK, well, there's an implicit argument called world and an implicit return value called world, which basically corresponds to everything. Okay, And so then when you read a function like this, you think of it like that, 
then you're on target. You got a mathematical, an appropriate mathematical corresponding type. Um, monad. I'm not going to get into monads. <laughs> okay, so now we have a nice translation. Do you see a function with these arguments? This is the corresponding mathematical type. But we can simplify this a little bit. Uh, it doesn't take very long to think about this, but if you have something that uh, has a product type like that, you can easily convert it into a function that returns another function. Um, I'm not really sure how to explain that. It like either clicks or it doesn't. Just say bind. Bind? Oh, bind. Yeah. There. Bind. Now you all understand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it turns out that this process called currying is pretty convenient because if you have a function uh, that looks like this, um, it turns out that when you uh, bind the first argument to something, you get another very useful function. Um, and I like this notation personally much better than I like bind and lambda when it applies. It doesn't always apply. Um, and so we're going to be saying that this arrow is right associative, so we can move those parentheses now. So if you see A, arrow B, arrow C, insert the parentheses on your, in your head from the right to the left. Just a question, because I've always sort of worried about this. There's nothing... There's nothing mathematically significant about binding the first argument as opposed to as opposed to any other one, right? I mean, I understand that you can get a nice clean syntax for it this way, but is there any is there any kind of deeper meaning towards why currying is more important than any of the other ways of binding things? Um, the the one thing that comes to the top of my head. Uh, that basically, when you use currying and you have a polymorphic concepts that apply to functions, you can take a function with multiple arguments and apply the polymorphic concept to this. You just see this as a function. Wait, what, are you, what are you? Are you? I can't tell what you're pointing at. Oh, sorry, you're you're something see, else. That, that's, sorry. What, that's what you're pointing at. What exactly? Yeah. The brackets. So. If you use currying, then you see this as a function. And if, if you have things that operate on functions, then um, it becomes a much more powerful mechanism. Because you can say, I want to apply it to this function, to this value, or apply it to the result of this function, which is another function. So I think that's what happens with bind also, though. Yeah. Well, um, when, when we talk about more abstract things like monads, uh, this comes into play. Pretty big deal. Okay, you show me out. Okay, so we can simplify our translation now with currying. It makes it a little bit cleaner looking. Uh, we don't need the parentheses and all that kind of stuff. That's closer to how functional programmers think about these things. But then we can go one step further. I.O. Okay? It stands for input-output, but don't think about it like that because it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with input and output. But the type function I.O. of A is just function that takes in the world and returns a world product A. Okay, so you recognize this is the right hand side of what we're talking about here. Um, yeah, it's the world. <laughs> so this would modify the world. That's very simply what that is. It's a world, something that modifies the world well, and extracts something from it. And you only need that world because we have global variables? Global variables, uh, global state, like the state of the screen, all that stuff. Lambda variables as well? I'm not sure how exactly this maps to member variables, but okay. um, anything that anything that isn't changing based on the input and the output of the function. Mm -hmm. yeah. Member function can be considered as taking the this point as a first parameter, so you're not saying that then then you can consider this a global function. Okay. I'd really like not to think about number functions at okay. this point. <laughs> uh, could you just remind me with the, the circle of the X again? I'm that is the problem. Thanks for the question. Yes, I know it <laughs> I know the word. 
what is a demon product? It's close. One of it's two. So one of a value type A and value type B. So you said modifying the world, and I, I look at that as adding stuff to the world. Is it, well, I, this this is the world before you modify it. Yeah. This is the world after. You've got the, yeah, different worlds, right? Different it's worlds. A different world. Yeah. It's got, but it's not. It's not. But it's not a subset of the earlier world. I mean, you can reference. You can always represent the previous world in the new world. Yes. Yeah. Right. I mean, theoretically, yeah. It depends on how big your world is. <laughs> well, but, but, but wouldn't the new world have one more member in the tuple? Wouldn't it be if the previous world is is of order n, then the next one would be order n plus one. I think that's a fundamental misunderstanding. The tuple has nothing to do with the world. The world is just part of that tuple. Because what we also yes. have in our clean, isolated world is now this new value, this A. That's what we read. We basically got a value from the world that we can use. And in the process of getting that value from the world, the world was modified. So we need to pass okay. that on to. OK, dig it. Thanks. Right. So we can't obviously implement world in directly in C++ because it's just way too vastly huge. Um, like it includes the sun, which <laughs> we can't put in our computer. So we, all we talk about is I.O. And that turns out to be enough. So here we have I.O. and a nice implementation of it is basically, we've seen this before, a boost function returning type A. That is sufficiently representative of I.O. in terms of the computer because a boost function can can send off missiles and that kind of thing. But it's more a, a representation of I in of, of, of O. And if it returns a value, it's more input than output. Well, part of what happens when you um, modify the world, you could be, you know, this world doesn't have anything on my screen, but, then but the I next need, one does. But I need to put the parameter there. The, the, the world is side effect. No, the reason you're seeing, the reason you're thinking that is that the world is implicit. It's an implicit argument to this function. So okay. you're not seeing, it's, you don't see it because in C++ we need the side effects. Okay. Okay. okay, so the convention is if I want to modify the global state, world, whatever we call it, we have to do it in an instance of struct I.O. Oh, yeah. and nowhere else. Um, you could think of it like that. I mean, we don't, we're not going to limit ourselves to this. We're not going to make instances of I.O. actually. But then where's the point in I.O.? The, well, for now, just okay. Just accept it. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is what we got. That's scientific discussion. So, we apply our C plus plus function to tuple with world. We get this. We apply current. We get this. Slow down. <laughs> well, I'm not gonna. I'm going to say this again slower, I guess. You apply C++ function tuple. Okay? Remember how I think of this as C++ function tuple? That corresponds to this large product type, and we add world. Okay? We curry the whole thing, we remove our product type, and we just end up with functions that return other functions. We new use our new I.O. concept to chop off this whole right-hand side. And then we get this. So this is like an instance where... Which is the right-hand side of that? Well, you're you're see a lot of arrows there. Uh, does anybody have a laser pointer I can borrow? Maybe? Yeah. I don't like the dead square dot. Okay, yeah. All right, so this over here... <laughs> okay. Isn't that a laser pointer? Yeah, I'm from Gamma. Yeah. Yeah. No. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> no competing lasers, all right? Um, so this, I'm considering the right-hand side. Okay. That corresponds to this. Right what? Too many people talking at once. This yeah. corresponds to this. Can you go back one step? Yep. Just make that. I over A is the same thing as this. So anywhere you see this, you can place with that. Take this, place it with that. So this is where otherwise curry without currying this wouldn't have really wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to do this. Can you use the one sentence? 
this function f is, you know, I don't care what steps, skip over the steps. The function f now is, is uh, you know, how would you say it? It's a function that returns a function, returns a function, that returns an IO, that returns an R. I would say like this, this I call you know what I'm saying? returns IOR. So that function up there is a function that returns a bunch, you know, that recursively returns functions that returns a function that returns a number. So basically, and one way to look at this is you, you're binding all of the arguments into this into this new function object, which has an effect on the world and returns a value. That's <coughs> completely readable. I mean, understandable once you. So, so what's the distinction between I'm not functional because I have side effects and I'm functional because I implicitly change the world? Um, <laughs> this isn't really an identity thing. Okay. Uh, in terms of if you feel like you're functional or not. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm doing is I'm very functional. Just think math. Okay. This, the type of this thing in math is this. If you look at this directly, this doesn't give you the mathematical type. Because math, if you don't give it some help, it can't handle side effects and all these other things. And that's what the world bought us. And so now we can, I'd say, even though this thing does I.O., we're still purely functional. We still haven't, we're completely in math, we haven't left it yet. Alright, so if you go to this website, you will get a page not found error. <laughs> because I haven't actually made it yet. Uh, but someday, or actually, I'm going to put my email address up at the end of this and email me if you're interested in getting this library. I'll make sure to let you know when it's up. But basically, I have GFP CIOF, which queried IO function um, that basically takes a C function pointer and converts it into a function like we formulated. So the, the way that you use this function is, you know, if A. A is your function pointer, then you'd apply the values one at a time. And then when you finally get to the I.O. part, that's an empty thing to actually execute. Where can I get such a, a modest and unassuming domain name stack? <laughs> Isn't that super brave? <laughs> <laughs> I've got a neat story about that, which I'll leave that for another presentation, I guess. Okay. But <laughs> and what and what sequence do I have to specify these parameters in this in this call? You just this one here? Yeah. It's just the function pointer. So uh, I mean, so the reverse the sequence or the reverse No, no, it's it's normal sequence. It's a normal sequence. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Oh, the right associate in this maybe that's the maybe that's the order of that question. Yeah. yeah. The fact that currying is right associative, so so that makes one think that you have to you have to supply the rightmost argument first because oh. all of these arguments are left associative, these these operators. So it's it's left to right. So the first argument of this C function corresponds to this when you apply it. So the same sequence as the normal function call. Yes. Yeah. So when you call it with just this thing, it returns a new function, which takes in the rest of the parameters and so on. So, in, 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 as a normal uh, C++ programmer, I would say A, parent, X, Y, parent. Exactly. So, normal C++ programmer, A, X, okay. Y. Which is what that just called, because you didn't call it a name. Right. So, when this thing occurs, then it cool. happens. Okay. Alright, and the other thing I have in here, which... Uh, uh, has this uh, C func thing? It's a type that'll return uh, the appropriate nested function type. And these are useful. Okay, so we're done with functions for now. Uh, does everybody is everybody ready to move on, or any more questions? Did you go back one slide? Yep. Oops. Okay, I'm going to 
the function signature of fun, of the auto function is uh, is so this function so a doesn't take any parameters, right? Oh, you're right. There should be a left parenthesis here, right parenthesis here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Around the. Yeah. Around the. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Generic programming. This is going to be somewhat tough to understand, so pay attention. <coughs> oh, I'm like, uh, I did part. So we're going to start with intuition. An empty thing. Okay. If I just use that word in English, an empty thing. Uh, I could be talking about any empty thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be a car. It could be a car, it could be empty, or it could be a room that's empty. I'm just saying it's an empty thing. Okay, so I'm saying, what, what, I'm, what I'm saying here is this is sort of a generic way to speak. I'm not being very precise. Um, there's something missing in order for it to be precise. All right, empty is a property of things. So an empty thing is different than empty. Okay, the room is empty, true or false. An empty thing could be that room or a different room. So, that, that, I'll be more precise about that in a minute here. Do you want to say that but not all? Yeah, not everything is empty. Or not everything can be, can be thought of as being empty. That's, oh, all right. Okay, good. There you go. Okay, so here's a formulation. We're going to start with an, an empty thing. So when we say we're missing something, to be more concrete, I think of that as a function. So the function takes in a type, and then I can show you uh, a value of that type that's empty. All right, so let me repeat that again. An empty thing is missing the type of the thing that we're talking about. So think of that as a function that takes in the type and returns you a value of that type that is empty. All right. So. I'm, I'm introducing some notation here. Um, how many of you guys have used Agda? I guess I should have expected that. <laughs> it's a dynamically typed programming language where you can write functions over types and types return types for values and values can return types. So it, it's pretty cool, but don't think about that because that's beyond what we're talking about here. So I'm saying the type of an empty thing is A, I'm saying the first parameter is something that is emptyable. Okay, because we can't have, not everything, not every possible object in this world can have a state which is empty. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. Like a block of wood, that's not empty. So I'm saying that this is emptyable, okay, we're taking in a type as the first parameter of this function. Okay, and I'm using this to say whatever that type is, I just want to call it A. So we take that type, and return a value of that type. Um, so if you just think of normal functions, think of this as a function which takes in a type and returns you a value. So if type is room, then it would point out the first, no, that doesn't make sense. So if, if the Why type is, is a room, value, I think that it will come up with some empty yeah. room. Exactly. Not empty room, some room. No, some empty room. Oh, it's an empty 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 no. empty room, right? Empty no. empty. No, empty empty is the restriction on the type. That's the concept that restricts the type. Yeah, but that room can be empty, may not be empty. Right? Yes, and, and the return value of this function, though, is an empty one. Oh, you have asked that object that you are empty or not? No? No. This is just saying, like, imagine zero. Okay, so this is something that zero means something. No, zeroable. Give me the identity, the additive identity of this type. So, right, it could, type could be a matrix, it could be complex of double, it could be int. The additive identity is some representation of that, some element of that type, some instance of that type that has mm -hmm. you know, a zero. It's additive. I didn't say more. But anyway, get it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I'm re reading this left triangle. You know, code very nicely gave me as has a profile in it. Okay, so A has a profile in emptyable as a type, and then it returns a value type A. Can you just say miles? You can say miles. I'll say as a has a profile because <laughs> the rest of my slides have that, but miles might be a better. Okay, and again, we're just sort of 
Make this concrete again. It's a function that takes in types and gives you values. And um, the, the type of the value it returns depends on the type that you give to it. So it's, it's a little bit to swallow, but it's really not that tough. Okay, so that's an empty thing. Let's look at empty. Okay. Um, we're missing a type, so the first parameter is a type that has empty, another something that can be thought of as either empty or not empty. Takes in a value of that type, which, um, so let's say, How's, how's empty different from empty? No. Emptyable gives you a value of that's that so type which is empty. Well. Emptyable returns a function that can tell you if a value of that type is empty. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's not a concept. I, I completely misread that. Okay. So I, I'm you write this function out. in okay. a slightly different way in that the function name is inside the parentheses. Yeah, you, this is like a nice C function pointer syntax. Okay. Okay, so let's, let's, let's say the first thing we're going to put in this thing is uh, a box. Okay? So what that returns is a function that takes in a box and tells you if it's empty. All right? I know. I know it's, it's, it takes a little bit to grasp this, but it's pretty neat. <laughs> we'll take your word for it. It's just the syntax is, is so non-uniform across the different domains that we're, we're looking at that it makes it harder to think about. And you can express all the same concepts with syntax that was a little less familiar to functional programmers, but would be easier for us to pick up, I think. That'd be neat. The hard part I, for me with, with the syntax here is that part of your type corresponds to the type of the rest of the function. And that's it's, it's going to be confusing no yeah. matter what. Can you back up a little bit? Yeah. So the last line is has empty as a function. Uh, you know, like a higher order function, whatever, has empty as a function that takes a type A and returns a function that will take an A and return a rule. Yeah, I wonder what's the type in front of the parentheses, because this thing doesn't return a type but a function. That's what confused me for a while. Okay. Well, first imagine that this A thing isn't in here. And let's say has empty is a set of types. Okay? Has empty is something that is looking like a C++ OX concept. Is I, that I don't want to go there yet. Uh, but if that helps you understand it, that's good. Um, okay, so just, just so let's get back to Dave's early interpretation and then he said, oh, you completely misunderstood it, but I think here's the thing that's corrected. So that makes us oh. question, why do yeah. we have empty in an empty thing and have empty in the lower thing? Shouldn't that be basically the same set of types? Maybe. Maybe not. Uh, <laughs> I mean, for anything that I can test whether it is empty, but it makes sense, that means empty there must be some instance that is empty and a way to retrieve it. I think that should be yeah. basically... No. I, I disagree. You, you might not be able to come up with a new instance. Exactly. Okay. It's like, but for instance, variant has an empty function which always returns false. <laughs> So has empty. Okay, I, I think I've got it. Do you mind if I map, try to map this on this on a, what we know again? Okay. I think I think has empty actually is a concept. Emptyable, I believe, is a refinement of has empty and uh, get me an instance, essentially. Um, and it's and it's a refinement of those two things where the where the fulfillment of get me an instance is a very particular thing that relates to the the other concept. So it's something we can't quite represent because it because it's the it's a representative of this other concept. Does it does that make sense? But that's not necessarily the case. Because <laughs> okay. you, you may be able to uh, you're saying that this is a refinement of this, but you may be able to create something that's empty, but you might not be able to tell if something is empty. So, all right, so if I mentally replace has a profile in with has the property, does that change the semantics for you, or is that is that preserve the semantic you intend? 
Concepts are, are independent of computability. I, I'm sorry to I'm sorry to interrupt you, um, but I'm still on this other thing. So that that has empty thing. There's there's two there's there's sort of two layers here. You've got <coughs> you've got the concept, which is there's this abstract set of things that can be empty, and whether or not we have a way to answer the question about a specific thing, that set exists conceptually. That's a concept. Okay. Then, then you're talking about you also have this this function that can answer the question about some subset <laughs> of those things, right? And there's some things that we can't answer the question about. Sure. Uh, we can talk about it afterwards, but I, I I still believe that these two are can we can have one that's emptyable and one that is not has empty, one that is has empty and one that is not. I, I agree. There's the, there's some concept in the background. I mean, there's two two functions that you're, you've got related to the concept that may or may not be computable. Mm -hmm. Sure. All right, so another way to look at this, you know, erase the A, has empty as a set of types, um, and it returns a function from something that will. The reason why I have to pull this little sucker out of there is because I need to use it on the right-hand side. And that's what makes these things confusing. And what's the word type in there? Yeah. I'm, I'm just saying question. empty has the type. Okay. So it's nothing special about that there. So, so empty is the symbol that's defined. Okay. No, I mean, empty because is the syntax the syntax in both stances is just the same and then I didn't really get what was defined in there. Yeah, empty is a function that okay. takes uh, type A that models has empty okay. and returns a function that takes an A and that will return a bool. Correct. No problem. You, got it. <laughs> <laughs> you were definitely able to say it. Right. Uh, you can also be careful. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to lift this up one level higher. Okay, bear with me and try to formulate exactly what, my, what I mean by empty bowl and has empty that kind of stuff. There's not much oxygen in this space. We're really on it already. <laughs> <laughs> I started to ask them, okay, it's like 85. <laughs> you guys are good people, so sorry, I'm going to keep an angle. I hope. Uh, so, <coughs> emptyable, we're saying this thing is a type class. Don't think anything about what that means, just I'm defining it as a type class. Okay, okay a type class is a set of pairs where A is a type or a type function. To think about it, maybe make it easier for yourself, just think about it as it's easier conception. And P is a profile that fits certain patterns and laws. Okay, so this is almost like a function over all types to a profile, except not all types are have a representation as a pair of these things. So you can think of it as a partial function, if you think that way. Um, or you can just think about it as a set of these pairs. Um, and we're choosing certain restrictions uh, when we think about these things uh, that make it less abstract, there's at most one pair per type, so you don't have multiple profiles per uh, type. You know, so there's nothing like a car. You can think of the trunk as being empty, or you can think about the the passenger seat to be empty. We're disallowing it. You have to be explicit uh, about it. So there's only one pair in there, and. The profile is a simple value, so what I mean by simple is that um, P can't include any types. Now we can easily extend this to include types, and you get what's called type families, but for our purposes, just think about it as it gives you a simple value. It could include a pair of functions or um, a tuple or whatever, a normal C++ um, value. So here is an element in that theoretical has empty set of pairs. The left side is the type we're calling a uh, vector of int, has empty obviously, and z, which is that function that we were talking about. Uh, it just returns if the vector is empty. Takes another vector, returns a bool. Yes, I am. So uh, 
um, this scene corresponds with this one, and this one corresponds with this one. Can we can we rename one of those? Would that be okay? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that changed the meaning. I, I want to know. No. Okay. That will not change the meaning. Uh, so. I need to stare. <laughs> so let, let's sit on this for a second. Um. Do you, you have time? I mean, like, maybe. Will you finish all the slides? <laughs> um. We'll see. Is it is it more important to finish or to have somebody get something? If, it, if everybody else gets it, then please move, feel free to move along. Oh, it actually gets confusing. Uh, well. <coughs> so, I won't hold things up. So, implement empty, okay, which is that function. We need to get the corresponding value, which is the function the, from bool to, from the type to bool, uh, from a type in has empty, like. Basically, the first part of this has empty thing. All right, so we're get we're we're, we're, we're sinking down. Yes. So, here's how we can think about this implementing this in C We have our function called empty. It takes in a type. We access the profile, and instantiate it, whatever. Pass in v and it'll return a bool. So this would be a way to explicitly uh, take one of these uh, higher level things and do it in C++. But in that okay. case, the template, a normal free function of template type t with the signature that it returns bool and takes no parameter would mimic the same thing. Well, you have to think in terms of this is maybe like partial template instantiation. Which also works for the free function. Yeah. So, given a type, it looks up the profile, which is the simple value we're talking about, and then uses it. So, you're talking about the, the simple value of the, the empty? And profile returns Z. Yeah? Profile returns Z. There are too many Z's there for me to even understand what that means. The, first the Z. function I Z. Even, I didn't get a chance to parse it. So. Well, let's go back. Okay. So remember here, the corresponding profile for this type is Z. Z is a function. This implementation is here, but Z is a function. That's what we're talking about. So when we go over here, we get that function by passing okay. in this type, and here we call it with so, an instance of B. So mtable is a set of pairs profile to uh, type to, to profile. Correct. Okay. No, mtable. That's, that's has yeah, that's the, the, the difficult thing because the, the qualifier was called has empty, but the function being defined is called empty. Yeah. Yeah. As empty was the was the concept the qualifier that for the types that match this function. I don't know what qualifier is. Yeah, yeah. the the, the um, equivalent class express thing. Okay. This is redundant. Does anybody know why? <laughs> What's that? That's what overload resolution does. Correct. By passing in V, we implicitly give it the type. So we don't need to have the type here. That's not real. <laughs> Sorry. I thought it was my computer. <laughs> Alright. Fits too long. So here we say that. That's probably pretty tough to read, isn't it? Same. Uh, same, same, same. That's really nice on my computer. Mm -hmm. I gotta look at my computer. So, uh, passing V of a known type makes the explicit type redundant. That that's, makes me sad because I don't like to waste my time doing stuff like that. Empty cannot be passed to functions, too, because it's a template. You can't pass, pass templates to functions. So, 
Let's see how we can really do this in C++. And let's start with polymorphic functions. The idea is to infer the type arguments from the value arguments. So here, we have a start called empty, which is basically just a function, uh, a functor. We make exactly one instance of it. And it has a result type, okay? And this can be anything that support, supports boost result value. So in this case, this pool is always going to be the result type. But in general, um, you can have a result type just dependent on what you're passing to it. And you can have one operator for each type that this thing supports. The profile. the profile is implicit in here. So the profile, in our case, is only a function that takes in a value of the type and returns a pool. But shouldn't it be called empty over here? If it, if it contains a set of pairs, or, or somehow holds a set of pairs, if it knows the answer to Conceptually, we can think of it as emptyable. Um, maybe you want to call this emptyable instead of empty. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm calling it this empty because I have a function a anymore that maps the type to a function, but it directly executes. It skips the intermediate yeah. steps. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, it's a different thing. so here's an example here. Empty of B, and then first the type from B, and returns just a bool. Mm -hmm. So we've seen this type of thing in C++, right? I'm just giving it a name. Same type inference trick doesn't work for values, though. Okay, because if I have a um, a value called like uh, an empty thing, I'm not passing it anything. The only thing I'm passing it is a type to get the value. So I'm inserting uh, a function called resolve that given a polymorphic value now, like empty thing, it, and, and a type, it'll return the value that corresponds to that type. And um, polymorphic values must follow a certain trait, which is described in the paper is really simple. I don't, I don't think I have it in here. Oh, I do. So here's an example of a polymorphic value. Um, It takes in a pointer to whatever the type is, that's just a dummy, and returns the, uh, a value appropriate to that type. So, and here we have to use the struct result thing. For those of you who aren't familiar with this, this is how to do uh, complex return values that depend on the input value. And this is a, an example of that. So, resolve, the resolve function just sort of hides all this mechanism into a easy to understand. So, so for I pass in a dummy int star, maybe it returns zero, because zero is my single empty value. Correct. For int. Yep. And if you pass in a char, uh, maybe char is a support, so it's a big compiler. So what is the this type? This type? Oh, I didn't include it in here. That's a convention that's used in a lot of boost libraries that, uh, that just refers to empty thing. Mm. Okay, we got polymorphic values, we got polymorphic functions, which are sort of special because you can automatically figure out the type, you don't have to explicitly do it. Um, and that's all we really care about for generics. As long as we have those two concepts, we're good to go. Uh, but they can't be extended to support new types without modification of underlying code. Like we saw all those different function overloads there. Um, if you have a a new type that supports a concept, then you don't want to have to go and modify the concept code. So, uh, and also we don't have any relation between related polymorphic values and functions. Like, if empty is a good example where there's only one thing that you talk, think about when something's emptyable. It has a property of that function empty. But for other things like maybe a group or you know some of these more abstract ideas, um, you have to have related um, polymorphic things, and they all need to follow some sort of laws. So we're going to extend this to do that with polymorphic classes. <coughs> and this allows you to collect certain polymorphic values and functions together into a thing, and 
you select the, it just uses partial template instantiation to select the supported type, which is, we all know how to do that. And the polymorphic entities select the appropriate instantiations when used. So, in the case of empty, you have that empty function and the implementation, instead of having one for each type, it looks up another thing, which I would call uh, <coughs> empty or whatever. And in there, using partial template instantiation, <coughs> it will select the appropriate value profile for a type. Um, so, uh, sorting out empty and emptyable, and it seems like it, it seems like uh, emptyable is um, is a concept like can can provide me with an empty value and. Empty is a concept like can tell me whether it's empty, and my and now I think well now it's confusing. You're talking about these two things all at the same time. Why did you introduce them at the same time? Do, do they go together into some thing that I missed? I missed that they both had to be there in order to understand what we're doing here. No, I probably should have chosen two unrelated things because they're just two examples, and we're going through and looking for two examples here. They don't relate. Okay. okay. So what does then the class get together? Because I had the impression that this is finally the place where those two concepts meet. Maybe. Uh, maybe you can make a class that says that, you know, this is the set of all types that are both emptyable and has empty. And that's that. So class isn't something that you instantiate, but uh, Nope, a set of, of types you can use to either map to values or functions. Yes. Okay. Call them type sets. Type sets? Uh, instead of classes. No. <laughs> uh, they're not classes, they're, they're class templates. Are they? Pretty much. Yeah. It's a class template. It's not a class, it's but it's almost a class. <laughs> this is the abstract concept I'm talking about. It's implemented in terms of partially overloaded classes, template classes. Partially specialized. Partially specialized, sorry. That's all right. Like the same thing. So I know I lost a well, bunch of you here. Is there a thing there that then that way, if I pulling that out, I can, I can now specialize my little new type? Yes. In the order? That's the idea. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's more like a trait, isn't it? Well, it's just a customization point. Like <laughs> All right, now we're going to talk about category theory. Okay, so we're going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> this is the last thing we're going to talk about. When do we get to particular mathematics? This, this is far beyond mathematics. Category theory. This, this is the definition of category. It deals abstractly with mathematical structures and relations between them. This is like a really, really abstract uh, mathematical discipline. Uh, they basically took like topology, set theory, and all this stuff, looked at what's common between them all, and then they have all these bunch of category theory concepts that match them together. Why do we care about that? The reason we care about it is because Okay, now we have these really generic things like empty and all this kind of stuff. What, what should we choose as our polymorphic classes? Like empty is one, but that's sort of ad hoc. What does math have? What does math give us here in terms of which uh, polymorphic classes we should be thinking? Of? So for those of you who, are, who have heard of monads, okay, that came from category theory, and that's an example of a polymorphic class that we use as guidance, uh, like in Haskell, they have a lot of monads, they have a lot of monoids, and all these things come from category theory because they turn out to be really useful. Monads and monoids are completely different type of thing, aren't they? Yes, they're completely different. <laughs> the, the thing that's similar between them is that they're both category theoretic concepts. Okay. We're going to look at mon mon monoids. Um, <laughs> Don't mention those two things in the same sentence. It's like a billion group or something instead. All right, anyway. All right, monoids and applicative functors. All right, let's look at monoids. A is a set or a type. Zero is an element of that set. And plus is 
a binary operator on them. A, zero, and plus form a monoid when plus is associative and zero is an identity for plus. Got that? Yeah. Pretty simple law. So we can start talking about all these different types of monoids, all these different things that fit monoid, that monoid concept there. And we'll look at a couple of them. There are, and there are a ton of monoids. So obviously int, plus, and zero give you a sum monoid. Bool, and, and true give you an all monoid. Because if you think about this, it tells you whether all of these things, uh, when you use that operator in between them all, it tells you if they're all true. And if you add true, nothing changes. That's it. That's it. Add it by It's zero. Yep. Okay. String concatenate and the empty string form a monoid. Question. So it's pretty much like a group except it doesn't have an inverse. It's a lot less. Um, it's pretty much not a group. It's in the same taxonomy of things as group is, mm -hmm. but it's, it's an in inverse. I think isn't the, the we don't in, in category theory we don't think about groups. Okay. Groups are way too specific for us. I <laughs> 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 like to work at a more abstract level. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. I mean, it depends on what you mean by more specific. Yeah. This is more general. Yeah. There are more things that fit. It's probably in pretty interesting in a few days. Nothing else to do. Um, okay, now now we're going to get to something very really interesting, and this might be a little bit tough to grasp. <laughs> but I know you guys have done well so far. All right. So, a function from A to M, where M is a monoid, that is a monoid. Okay, the operator. That we're, that we're talking about, uh, basically. So when we're talking about the operator, we know that it needs to take in two functions like this with the same monoid type. The result has to be of this type as well. It needs to be another function that returns a monoid. And what it does is it takes in this value a, this is the result function we're talking about, applies it to the first argument, applies it to the second argument, and then uses the monoid operator of the result value and puts them together. Could you please try to formulate that in the same parallel way to the first view one? Where we've got the we've got the type you're operating on, the operation, and the identity. Alright. So the type we're operating on. A to M where M is a monoid, which means that M has a corresponding plus and it has a corresponding zero. Okay? So this is the type we're talking about. Okay. If A is a type, this is the type. No, A is a type. A is a type. This is a type function from type to. Yeah, can you just name the function then? I think the association, the, the combination. No, what, we're, what we're missing is the operation and the identity. Yeah, we need, we need two objects from that, so please call the first function something. Otherwise, this discussion is a bit hard. Um, it can be anything. It can be no, a it's called A. It's got a name right there. Okay, so it's called A. A is the mm -hmm. function from A to M, where M is a monoid. Oh, okay. We, if, oh. We, if we lose our. Uh, polymorphism, maybe specific, then we're missing the point. <coughs> this is really general, and it's supposed to be. So our function that we're talking about here, we'll call it plus of, let's call this z, is this type, plus of z. We we call it f, so. <laughs> well, we want to think about it, because this is the plus, the monoid plus associated with m. We just want to call it m because it's a function. Yeah. That's it. Instead of z. So you missed my point. But. We can call it f. <laughs> it's math, you can call it whatever you want. Okay, so the type of this function, we know what the type is because we're making a monoid, right? It takes in a function from A to M, another function from A to M. Anybody guess what the return value is? Okay. 
So it's an operator on, on functions that combines them. Okay. okay, now remember our uh, this is resolution here. We can remove these and it doesn't change anything. So when I talk about plus sub f, we'll call that one a, we'll call that one b, we'll call this thing c, This is equal to, let's see, A applied to C, okay, and we know when we take A and apply it to C, we're going to get a value by M, okay? So now we can talk about plus M of C. Oh, wait a second, wait a yeah, don't use A. Start, start that over. Try it twice a year. So now you get to use it. Yeah, good thing. That's a good point. All right. Take A time of sibling. Yeah, we'll get into the green button. Just to keep my brain straight, okay? This isn't. <laughs> this is not a T. This is not a T. This is not a T. Right? You yeah, that's correct. Pluses. pluses. Okay. You start it. What did that M go? The last one. This is the return value. Okay. Uh, what what so did that M go in? This? That M is just the type of this whole thing returns to an M. So, could you write it? Equals N. Write what? Let me, you have, is there an arrow? Plus F is this function. And when you say the same plus F, this is something different. This is saying, this is the type of plus F. This is the implementation of plus F. Okay, so this this is what we're defining as our plus. We're still missing one thing, right? We're missing our zero. Zero. Okay. Hard to math. The formal review it is. What's its type? Correct. Any idea what the implementation might be? You know what needs to take in? A value of type A, which we're calling X. Mm -hmm. And its return value is. Unconditionally, the zero value of M. It's just the metamonoid. It's just the metamonoid. Yeah. Just the metamonoid. That's what he said. Just the metamonoid. Four words in that statement. I can identify two of them. <laughs> so this is showing that any function from A to a monoid also forms a monoid with this plus operator and this zero operator. Okay. We're really abstract at this point because monoids apply to a lot of things, they're very general. And it's very interesting when you start doing things like functions um, with these category theoretic concepts. Can I, can, I, can I drop that right down to C++ and say that that zero of, of M is trying to default initialize my default value for my type? That's, that's T, T bracket zero? Now, we always want to know for I'm in generic code and I've got, if I need to the int, I know I can pass zero into this int. I, I just have a T and I don't know what the zero is, but I... Yeah, well, either I, I try the default constructor, or I hope that zero passed into the, 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 the zero for this type. Right? Well, there's, a, there's a problem. You see, this is an identity with respect to an operation. So, true, true. So, yes, it, it yeah. could be zero or one, depending if you're yeah, looking yeah, at yeah, it. Yeah, it depends on the type. Sort of. So, we can implement this in C++ using the strategies I mentioned earlier. 
monoid would be one of those things with the pairs, where the left hand side is the type of the monoid, like this, or this, and the right hand side is going to be these two things, the plus and the zero for the monoid. Um, let's look at a quick example. Let's say in C++, you got something, um, a function called header, which takes in a message and returns a string. You have another function called contents, which takes in a message and returns the string. You follow that so far? Yeah. Oh. Two very simple functions. Now what we're going to do is we're going to call monoid plus. Okay, we're calling it m plus. Right here, of header and contents. We already looked, the strings are monoids indeed, remember? The concat operator and the empty string. So we do plus with header and contents. The return value is going to be a function from a message to a string, okay, because these are message to strings, call not payload. So we're creating a new function on the fly using monoid plus that basically takes the message, gets the value of the, runs that function on it to get the header, runs that function on it to get the contents, and concatenates them together. Okay, a lot of stuff's going on, uh, but all we're writing is this right here. And this sort of gives you a feeling as to what the, what the style of programming this is like. Very little code. Very, very powerful components. Um, and this is called point-free programming. You might say that it's pointless. <laughs> <laughs> Something that, that hurts my brain about this is that um, is the, uh, the string you've given one way that it can be in a monoid, but I happen to know that what well, int, for example, has at least two ways to be in a monoid, probably more. Yep. And so there's some there's some implicit assumption happening here about like what operation you're using. That's right. So I'm glad you brought that up. The way that we've defined our polymorphic classes, remember when we said we're doing our constraints, that one of the left hand hand side of the pair can only have one pair in that scene. Okay? That's that's what that portion Right. Now that doesn't limit us, but that doesn't mean that we can't do monoids in in other ways. It's just saying that if you want to have a different monoid for int, for example, one for times, one for plus, then you need to wrap it into a struct. And that's in the functional programming community that's that's how they do it. Where's the term point free? Point um, free? it's it's a little bit tough to explain that uh, in just this lecture. I could probably talk another, another lecture about what I, why it's called point free. But it's just the mathematics behind all this stuff. There are these things called points. When you have a function like this, it's there are no points. <laughs> yes? Where's the message come from? Nowhere so far. It's a function. No, this is close. Yep. You can call payload with a message. The result is a string. I go there and I swap around. I got a little colon here. Functors and pointed. These are like two abstract concepts. Concepts and all functions and containers, like in the STL, fit this concept. It just doesn't, doesn't, I'm not going to go through exactly what these are, but uh, just give you some idea. Idiom, which is also called implicative functors, these are really neat. Because with these you can do functional reactive programming. I don't know if you guys have heard of that, but it's pretty amazing stuff. And you can do streams, um, like we talked about earlier. Fit this idiom concept. Um, monads, monads, I don't know how to pronounce them. Arbitrary computations can be thought of as monads. And this gives ways to combine computations to chain them together. Um, foldable. Um, some of you are familiar with what the fold operation is. Well, there's an abstract foldable uh, type class that allows you to take collections of things and compress them together into one thing. And that turns out to be really useful and applies to all kinds of different containers. I'm just trying to give you a sense as to uh, how broadly applicative this stuff is. It's, it's 
part of it is like mathematicians have already gone over all this and come up with the concept and separated the concepts into the useful ones and said, you know, mon monoid on its own is a useful concept. That's why we'll give it a name. And now C++ programs are going through the same process in a lot of ways. And, you know, which concepts are worthwhile, you know, is regular type an important concept or is this an important concept? So mathematicians already did it all. Exactly. And it's, it's called category. Yep. Nine times over. I mean, in the, in the M3000 thread, the one before concept was, was both. There was a lot, uh, there were a lot of these basic concepts were formulated as con core concepts in it. <coughs> All right, functional programming in C++. What happens when you actually try to program this way? Your design is much cleaner. Like, think all the way back to when we started talking about algebraic data types. Conceptually, your designs become much cleaner. Um, and that leads to cleaner code, for the most part. Unless you go optimize it for speed, then that always happens. But um, less code and static types. Okay, so if you're using these powerful concepts like monoids and stuff like that, you're going to have less code. And um, the combination of that and static types, you're going to have less bugs. I, I think it's pretty well known that the more succinct the code, um, the number of bugs per line remains about the same. Did you see C code? What's that? Succinct. I, succinct. Doubt, I doubt that for the average no, he says succinct. 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 S-U-C-C-I-N-C-T, -C -C I think. Shorter. And like we saw with uh, monoids, you get these really, really powerful tools. They're just really uh, <laughs> widely applicable and can do some pretty amazing things. So that, that's all functional programming in general. That's why people learn functional programming. That's why it's, you know, huge academic research. It's, it, it's awesome. Here in C++ in particular, why I think this is really beneficial. You don't need to switch languages. You don't need to use some esoteric language like Haskell and learn all this new syntax. Um, you can stick with C++. Um, and all this stuff integrates really well. It just looks like normal function calls. Of course, you can't get away from having to learn something new. But that's normal. Um, it's easy to use, no special syntax. Like in the FC++ library, there was an old library about functional programming, or Boost Lambda. You don't need to learn any kind of special syntax, just normal syntax. Someone can make syntax on top of this, but the core is normal syntax. And C++ is highly capable. We, we did some pretty abstract things in C++, and some of them that are even beyond Haskell at this point, because of the because templates are just that powerful. So um, that, I think, ends my presentation. Um, and I can tell you that I use this in real code, and I'm not just inventing this and telling you that I think it ought to work really well. It does work very well. Do you have, I mean, I'm wondering if you have one slide there that just shows a small program written with this method. Um, I mean, just so we could just have a look at it and uh, have a look, see what it looks like. What you see is what you get. Um, but that's my point. If you some of my functional code, yeah. I'd have to explain to you a little bit how to use this. Like I was going to, I had a second half here, I'd explain to you about how functional reactive programming works. Yeah. And I'd be able to show you some code. There. Um, afterwards, I can, if you're just interested in having a look, I can show you some. Well, I, I was just, it's kind of like a, a voyeuristic desire to <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I just can't imagine from what you've described what a small program written like this would look like. Yeah. Um, you could show them the IO streams code. Yes. Uh, IO stream, the, the work we've been doing this week on IO streams uh, is implemented in this style. So. Mm -hmm. Um, that would be a good example of it. I sent you the text slide. Thanks. So, what is performance like? I mean, I understand you know function to function. I know. Yeah, where where would bottlenecks be? If you said that. Um, when you do things like currying an I/O function, it turns out small things that you wouldn't think are would make it slow, like returning a, a unit type at the end, um, it slows it down. So. Generally, the way that I use this is I come up with a conceptual mathematical model. I implement it directly using these tools. 
and then I go in and I optimize it using C++ techniques. And I, and I believe that that, I don't, I don't think that anybody's really done that yet in the functional world, because that optimizing stuff in C++ is pretty straightforward and easy. Is it, is it like compile-time heavy? Not really, not really, because there's only a few things in there that, that use, use templates and nothing really fancy. I'd rather be more the other compile-time heavy than that time. <laughs> it's, uh, you'd be surprised how fast it is. It's just when you want to get really, really fast, which happens a lot in my work, I do CAD CAM work, then you need to go in there and, and do things. So it's not like unbearably slow. It's what you'd expect. It's, it's good speed. But, um, but it gives you the ability to go in there and optimize it better. Any other questions?